Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. <clears throat> Listen now for the word of the Lord. Through Jesus, therefore, <coughs> let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruits of lips that confess his name. One more time, just because it's short. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. This is the word of God. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you and praise you for your word, for your love, for your son, Jesus, for opportunities to seek you and to know that you have promised if we seek you, you will truly be found. We seek you this day. Oh God, let us find you, let us experience you, let us celebrate you, and let us realize that indeed we are your children and we are made to worship you, oh God. We thank you. Amen. Listen to this psalm, Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in, behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become noon around me, even the darkness will be not dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Say that with me. I praise you, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Isn't that a powerful song? I was thinking about that a lot this week because um, I'm very excited that at our 11 o'clock worship today, we're going to baptize baby Kemper, baby um, Kemper Scott Boston. That's Gene Foster's great-grandson, and we pray for him a lot. You you raised um, Meredith, Morgan Meredith, in this church. You helped raise her up when she was a youth, and now she's the mother of a beautiful boy who was born big, but too soon. It's a very strange thing to have a premature baby that weighs like 8 to 10 pounds. He was a big boy, but he wasn't fully developed. And so when he was born, there were some kind of scary moments, and you prayed for him. And God swiftly answered prayers because it didn't seem like long. I'm sure it was long for his family, but it didn't seem like long from our perspective, not being there day in and day out, before we started hearing wonderful reports of this baby boy and how he was growing and how his body was developing more fully the way that it was supposed to before he was born. Fearfully and wonderfully made. I had a great time on Tuesday meeting with Morgan and Joe and baby Kemper um, to talk to them about his baptism. And um, he is such a good baby. I don't know if you've seen him or kept him in the nursery, but he's happy almost all the time. The only time he cried was when he fell over and bumped his head on the floor. And other than that, he was laughing and cooing and talking the whole time. And I was holding him, 
in my um, office chair. And um, if you walk into my office, straight ahead of you, there's a big picture of Jesus on the wall. Some of you have seen that. You know what I'm talking about? Big picture of the face of Jesus on the wall. And I was holding Kemper like this, and he was looking over my shoulder. And I got to tell you, there was something really cool happening there. That boy, Jesus, are already communicating. He would look up at that picture of the face of Jesus, and he would just laugh. The sweetest little baby belly laugh that you've ever heard. And I thought, this is something that spiritually happened. This child already is communicating with Jesus. He already knows. When was the last time that you and I looked for the face of Jesus first? When was the last time that we looked for the face of Jesus? And then the second question is, when was the last time that you and I looked for the face of Jesus and when we saw it were filled with joy, unspeakable joy that just made us giggle right from the center of our spirit? When was the last time you felt that way about your Savior? Scripture tells us about how wonderfully we're made. And how even while we are still in our mother's womb, God gives us the things that we need to live a life of praise. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. When I read that scripture and when I read other scriptures, like the one little verse we read from Hebrews that basically just says, use everything that you have to praise God because you can it causes me to think about how I use everything that I can to worship God because I can or how I don't quite always use everything that I have to worship God even though I can. Scripture tells us in lots of different places how we're engaged, our bodies are called to be engaged in worship. Do you remember? David danced before the Lord with all of his might. We're not talking about a kind of motion. We're talking about a foot stomping, heart raising, hallelujah dancing before the Lord with all his might. Scripture tells us that we are called to engage not just our bodies, but to engage our emotions so much that it causes us to have laughter or tears or just that thumpity thump thump in our hearts that we forgot we had within us. And scripture calls us to remember that we're called to engage not just what we have in our bodies, but what we have outside of us. That we're called to engage our finances, our resources, all that we have and all that we are in our worship of God. Sunday before last, when we worshiped at the Kambini United Methodist Church, um, you see some pictures of the Kambini United Methodist Church in the <coughs> lady minister that they had, Pastor Olivia was a beautiful woman. I kept trying to get a good picture of her. As you saw in the pictures, their sanctuary was decorated because it was their special Thanksgiving service. Not Thanksgiving Day like we celebrate in this country, but Thanksgiving for what God has done for them. And when we entered the church on the altar were things like uh, cassava, which is that tree that has the big roots at the bottom that you see. That's something that they eat a lot of. It doesn't have a whole lot of nutritional value, but it fills your belly. Um, there was cabbage laying on the altar and lettuce. There were stalks of corn. There were bougainvillea branches decorating beautiful pink, hot pink blooms all over the place. And, and so I kept trying to take a picture of Pastor Olivia because she's such a beautiful woman. You can just, her whole, you ever see somebody that just their whole body exudes the joy and the love of Jesus Christ? This woman, her face was beautiful. Her spirit was beautiful. And you just wanted to watch her and participate with her in worship. It was contagious. And the people began, because it was a special Sunday of Thanksgiving, they began their worship um, by singing, of course. And we have a wonderful video uh, of the choir dancing down the aisles as they came. There were no drums. There was no piano. There was just the human voice and the rhythms that are already a part of our bodies. Who has a rhythm in your body right now? Are you dead? <laughs> Who has rhythm in your body right now? 
I hope you all do, because your heartbeat ought to be beating. So, um, you got some rhythm with a bump bump, hopefully. You ever, you ever find yourself sitting at a seminar or something, checking your pulse? <laughs> I used to do that in my, my classes sometimes when I was a student. And one time the professor stopped the class and looked at me and said, are you alive? <laughs> and so maybe we need to ask ourselves that sometimes. Are you alive? Maybe we need to check our pulse. Maybe we need to feel that rhythm because that's part of the way that God has made us fearfully and wonderfully. Anybody have a respiratory rhythm? I hope you do. Once again, if you don't, you know. Anybody know CPR? <laughs> okay, good, good, just in case. So our bodies already, in the way that they were made, have got rhythm. And these people, you could tell that they got the rhythm in their spirits, in their hearts, in their way of life as they danced down the aisle, singing and praising God. It was a wonderful way to enter into worship. There were things that even though um, most of the service was in Chitswa, which even some of the people um, that live in that area, because the national language is Portuguese, even some of the people that live in that area don't speak Chitswa, which is the native tribal language. Um, the worship is in Chitswa, so we couldn't understand all of it. There were some things that you could understand because of the rhythm of the words. Like... Um, the Apostles' Creed was said earlier in the service. The Lord's Prayer was said. And because of the rhythm, we knew what was going on. And whether you knew the Apostles' Creed or the Lord's Prayer, or whether you knew any of the songs that they were singing, it was hard to not get caught up in the rhythm and the praise of the worship of the people. Because it was their Thanksgiving Sunday, each group within the church, and I believe that this was like a district event, so there were several different churches represented, each group within the church came forward to bring their offerings. And they would sing and they would dance. Now, not all of them had money. Some of them had paper money. Some of them had coins. Some of them had cabbage. Some of them had coconuts on their head. The most wonderful one, I thought, was the lady who came up the altar, up to the altar to give her gift, which was a duck sitting on top of her head. <laughs> There's a picture of that in there, too. That's what they had. That's what they had to offer. And they gave of the first fruits. They gave of the best that they had because they could. For an hour and a half before we left, they brought the offering forward. Can you imagine an hour and a half of offering yourself to God? When it came time for our team to um, take our offerings forward, you know, we'd taken some cash. Mostly it was American cash because we hadn't even charity in a whole lot of our money, but they could find a way to do that. And so um, when, we, when it came time for us to take our cash up, we were scrambling among us going, we should probably sing something when we go up there. What should we sing? And, uh, and so we, we sang a song that actually comes to us from the African culture, and it's in the faith we sing. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of God. It was a little bit embarrassing to try and sing a song that came from their culture to them, but it was the only thing we could think of that had good rhythm, um, and so that we would fit in with the rest of the offerings. And we were able to process up with the rest of the people and to add our offerings in their baskets. And you know what they did? Talk about accountability for your giving. Every class, their offering was taken up separately, and they took it off and counted it separately. Hmm. What if somebody knew what you were giving? Would you be embarrassed, or would you be excited because you gave the best and all that you could bring? It wasn't just in church, though, that the people had a rhythm and um, an opportunity for worship. It was everywhere that we went and everything that we participated in. Um, the biggest project that we were working on, our primary project, was um, putting the roof on the men's dormitory. The students who are, um, they, they have a seminary there in Cambini. Um, Cambini is um, a mission headquarters. They have, did he say 800 hectares? So it's like 1,600 acres. And a hectare is two acres. So the mission compound is about 1,600 acres. It's a pretty big place. And they have um, schools. They have elementary school. They have a, a secondary school. They have a high school. They have trade schools. One of the trade schools was named, does anybody remember the name, Bishop Joseph E. Pennell? He was the bishop who ordained me. He was bishop before last here in our conference. Um, bishop Pennell and his wife gave um, money for a school. And there's the sign that says Bishop Joseph E. Pennell um, agricultural school. 
Um, so there's an agricultural program at the trade school where students can take either agriculture or carpentry. Um, and so we got to see, you'll see a, um, a sign that says something about fighting hunger has a picture of a chicken. Um, they're teaching them how to, to deal with animals and how to deal with crops. They told us about um, their rice crop and um, a lot of the crops that they teach students how to work on there, they also give to the orphanage, which is also on the Cambiti um, site. They have 59 children um, that they support through the orphanage. And so they said all of the rice from the rice harvest goes to the orphanage. And I said, how does it work? I've never actually seen rice growing. And um, I didn't actually get to see their field, but as we were driving down the road, Maurice said, that's rice right there. So I got to see where it grows. I thought rice grew in the water all the time. Apparently they bring in the water for a certain period of time, and then the water goes back out for a certain period of time. Guess how they control that there at Cambini? God does it. On the full moon, the water rises up and fills up the rice paddies. And then when the appropriate time is, most people have to do it by hand. Um, but not there. God does it for them. God brings the waters in and God resends the waters and their harvest grows. God must know they're feeding 59 orphans with that crop. He's taking care of his children. The seminary students would work with us. Um, the women and the men students. The first week we were there, um, the students were on holiday. And so um, from Monday through Thursday, they were working with us. The male students worked with us right at the project, and the women students worked with some of the members from our team painting. You'll see some pictures of people painting roofing tin. It had to be painted before we put it up. And um, just working with the students, you begin to learn the rhythm. They taught us this song that we started calling the Holy Ghost Macarena. And it's, um, <laughs> and, and I wish I could have gotten the words in sheets while, but the first night that we um, actually met with the students um, to worship together one evening, um, they taught us this song, and it's, um, Jesus is so good, I don't know how it goes in swat, swat, uh, sheet squad, but that's okay, you wouldn't know me there. Jesus is so good, Jesus is so good, e ya 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 e ya And they would do this thing that they would, you throw your hands out, and they go, Jesus is so good, and the whole congregation would go, e ya try that with me, e ya Jesus is so good, e ya Jesus is so good. And then everybody would do this. E -ya 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 -ya. It was wonderful, the Holy Ghost Macarena. We learned it in Africa. It was wonderful. Our favorite song, we called it the Ya Ya song. And um, it was wonderful because they would sing it when they were working. They would sing it when they were worshiping. Um, and they would just sing songs everywhere that we went. And everything that we saw, people were singing songs. One of the projects that... Um, I had the opportunity to visit, Maurice stayed on the work project, um, but I had the opportunity to visit the widows. Um, there are about 30 women um, who live together in a little village um, in Masinga, which is about 45 minutes drive from Cambini where we were staying. And um, these women, once their husbands have died, they are often cast out of the family primarily out of greed because the children want their inheritance and they are no longer responsible <coughs> for the mothers and so they cast them out. They don't give them any care. And so most of these were elderly women. In the photos you might see some pictures close up of elderly women but you'll see them sitting on the ground on thatched mats kind of in a semicircle in the photos that we have. And, um, and when we first arrived to visit the widows we were taking food and some clothing for them and just an opportunity to worship and visit with them. And I don't think I've ever received a more grand welcome than we received that day. Because the women came and they had taken bougainvillea blooms. Do you know bougainvilleas? The blooms are pretty tiny, about that big. And they had stitched them together just on thread, nothing fancy. They had stitched them on thread and made like flower leaves for all of us when we got there. There were probably eight of us from the mission team that visited there. And they danced out to the car to meet us with the flower lays, and they had handfuls of blooms, and they threw them up in the air, and they were, yay, 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 woo, and singing their songs and dancing their dances, um, all to the glory of God, in their work, in their play, in their worship, they remember God. Because they still have an understanding of something that in the midst of technology and busyness of life, we've somehow lost, I think. And that is 
that we were made for worship. Body, mind, and spirit, we are made to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's another culture. That's a story of a two-week portion of my life. But then what about us here? Were we made fearfully and wonderfully? Well, yeah. Were we made with all the things within us that we need to worship our Creator? Yes. Then how will we find Him in the rhythms of our daily life? I challenge you this week to look for the face of Jesus. And I promise you, if you look for Him, you will find Him, because He said so in Scripture. Seek me. Look for the face of Jesus. And then, when He reveals Himself to you, open your eyes to really see Him. And allow Him to fill you with His glee. <coughs> Maybe you'll have a sweet little baby giggle belly laugh. Maybe you'll shed a tear. Maybe your heart will just beat a little faster. Maybe you'll worship Him for that moment and all the moments after. With all you have. With all you are. Because we were made for worship. Let us pray. Holy God, we do thank you for indeed we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Remind us, God. Take us back to recognizing our own heartbeat. And listening to our own breath. To recognize that we are precious and holy and desired by your spirit that you love us enough that you took the time to create each and every one of us nobody's DNA is exactly like anybody else's every single one of us created fearfully and wonderfully by your hand remind us God those things that you implanted in us a long time ago that while we were yet in our mother's womb, remind us that you knew us. Remind us that you loved us and claimed us as your own. And that you want us back again. Call us back to you. Help us to find the rhythm in our daily life to worship you. <coughs> Thank you, God.